Hello everybody. Uh, many months ago, when the when the guys started like that. Ah, ah, soy Wilda Castro Suarez. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, many months ago, Craig one day told me, Awilda, I had a dream about you. You were a balloon and you were deflated. You have to write something about it. And oh well, that is very you, Craig, accept it. This is a short, short story I wrote, I wrote deflated to Craig. <laughs> and the epigraph is, in there it becomes easier to accept day after day that I'm not going to be the man I thought I'd be when I grow up. That is from the poem Letters from the Cineflex by Jeff Rath. My mother was a secretary during the day, a student in the evenings and a receptionist during the weekend. She was always running from one place to another in her high heels and secretary uniform. Back then, I wanted to be a lawyer. I dreamed with the big wood desk, the sober decoration of my office in a skyscraper, and the admiration of everybody. I had big dreams. I wanted to be as ready as I could to enter college. Voca vocational school under my eyes was for underachievers. My mom drilled my head every day during eighth grade. She insisted that I must go to Bowtech in order to learn a trade. She mentioned all the opportunities to work while going to college. I resisted because I wanted to be more than her. I wanted the prestige, the money, the lifestyle. I wanted everything, and being a simple secretary was too low. I don't know how she did it, but I budged. I end up spending my time and efforts in secretarial classes. I hated it. Filing was the worst. Shorthand was torture. I was the worst student in typing. I promised myself that that was it. I will finish, but I will never use it. My dreams were waiting for me. I went to college and changed from law to literature and then journalism. I was so proud of myself. It was the beginning of the life I wanted. Then I crashed to reality. Hundreds of college students graduated each year and there was not a job, a, a job available to all of them. So I did what everybody else did. I went to school for my master's degree. In between, I was a cashier at a supermarket, a salesperson at an African store, and a waitress at a pizza restaurant. I avoided all the clerical jobs. I didn't want it to be like my mother. Finally, all my efforts were paid off. I found the job of my dreams. I was editor of a newspaper. I was able to buy a house, to travel, have a dog, a meaningful love relationship. The American dream was mine, and I was enjoying all of it. Then the recession of 2008 hit me in the face. There was no job, no significant other, no prestige. I was left with nothing. The bills were piling up, and there was no job on near sight. Browsing through the paper, I found an ad that they were looking for a bilingual clerk at the school district. I applied and got the job. The first few months, I told myself that was just a stage. I will move forward eventually. Three years after, I was comfortable. My bills were paid. I had a good health insurance, retirement plan, and a great team of coworkers. Sometimes the feeling of failure will seep in and bother me. In those days, I feel that going to college was worthless, an investment that did not pay off. But most of the time, I think I should wear a big sign saying, karma is a bitch. Thank you. Thank you. Your name. When I say your name, I want to say memory. I want to say tenderness a smooth blanket in a sleep time, tired eyes but always alert. When I pronounce your name, I evoke coffee, recién colado, recently brewed, rice with green pigeon peas, savory vegetables in the stew, pork legs with chickpeas, 
the cake married with the cold milk, the orange candy stuck in your teeth and gums, the movie that gave you nightmares and the usual insistence to sleep with you after. When I say your name, I smell maha powder, pond cream, final touch softener, Avon perfume, dove soap. I smell cilantro, cilantrillo, garlic, onion. I smell sofrito. When I say your name, I think in your black eyes, almost blind, of your white hair without dye, of your wrinkles, of your big ears, of your falling butt and your long eyebrows, of your legs full of varicose veins in the time you used to say they were fat and beautiful legs. And I think of your tailored dresses made with the fabrics of La Tienda Paco, of your black shoes polished with griffin. And I think about you, happy, with a clear mind again, with organized memories, with your whisper to calm my tears, with the saying, what mattered is that I love you. And I think of you without insanity, courses and bad words in the time when we had innocence already. I think about you with eternal love, eternal like memories. I think about you as the most beautiful thing in my life. When I say tenderness, love, support, feelings, memories and bonds, I want to say grandmother, I want to say Mercedes. Thank you. Can I read another one? One more. Okay. Uh, as millions of other uh, other people in the world, I suffer from he mental health issues, and not everybody understands how it is. This is my poem for for that. Magnificent, an epigraph. The epigraph reads, courage does not always roar. Sometimes courage is the quiet voice at the end of the day saying, I will try again tomorrow. Marianne Radmacher and my poem. What do you see when you look at me? Yes, you may see a broken soul, a deep spiral of madness and hurt, my countless suicide attempts, my hospital tags, the cuts in my legs and arms, my rapid rage, my clinginess. Yes, I am all that and more. It's true I fall deep, that I have moments in which I lose sight of the light, moments when hope does not fill my phantomless void. It's true I have fallen to the ground. I wounded my knees. I swallowed stones and dirt. I have been beaten, rejected, cursed. Certainly, I lost many battles, but even crawling, I kept moving. Even if today I seriously thought about quitting, I didn't, I'm still here. I may fall hard and deep, but most people won't come back to glue the pieces together and be proud of the cracks. I fall down, but I come in majestic ways. Most people get born in hell. I went there and came back in one whole piece. So next time you are unable to define me, look in the dictionary. You will find me under magnificent. Thank you. imagine that I will have groupies, but I guess that's good. Thank you, Cindy. I am going to read one that I read already in the other thing. So, Cindy, I'm going to read The Suburban Lady. Just for you, baby. Poem to the Suburban White Lady. This poem is for you. The lady that closes her purse when I sit near you that looks amazed when I say I have more college degrees than you, that I speak two languages and was brave enough to leave everything behind to follow my dreams. In each glimpse you give me, I can feel your scorn, 
because I am not white like the snow, because my English is accented. When you look at me over the shoulder, you lose sight of my dignity, of me and all my people who wakes up before the sun rises to pick the fruit you eat in your nice house in the suburbs. When you look at me like a second class American citizen, because I am Puerto Rican, you forget the historic fact that your country invaded mine and my people died in your wars when you were dancing foxtrot in Myrtle Beach. When I look at you and smile, what I want you to realize is that no matter if I arrive in the Mayflower, in an airplane, or I swam to the Rio Grande or across the desert, how I got here does not matter. The issue is whether you like it or not, I'm here and I'm not leaving. Thank you. The funny thing is, the more people like, the most people that like that poem is because they live in the suburbs.